Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am delighted to introduce Craig Rosenberg, Chief Platform Officer at Scale Venture Partners, where he helps over 50 portfolio companies build go-to-market machines. But one of the things about Craig is that he is a well-known name in all content related to go-to-market. He co-founded and was Chief Analyst at Topo which really defined sales sales tech space. And that company got acquired by Gardner, where he was one of the leaders in, in the sales practice. And so we are very fortunate to have Craig's perspective on everything sales tech, MarTech, and beyond. Craig, welcome to the pod. I'm excited after that intro. That was uh, <laughs> perfect. High energy. Well <laughs> Great. Happy to be here. Listen, I'm really happy that you're here because I think you could be described as OG of the content related to our space, you're right? You, we were publishing thought leadership that I think at some point influenced me and validated our hypothesis about why we should go build Relate to, which is one of the <laughs> reasons why we're also doing the podcast to engage all the audience. And so I'm really curious to begin by getting your take at how you've seen content evolve in the B2B space as a vehicle for marketing and sales. And our audience will know some of the vendors, like we had founders of Eloqua here and Scott Brinker from HubSpot now, but previously all the MarTech MarTech massive diagrams, scary things that he's built. Don't be afraid to drop names of companies. We'll, we'll have a sophisticated group of folks listening to the vendors. Yeah, you led with a big one. By the way, for fun, my sort of start in thought leadership was, I call it around 2008-ish when the marketing automation platform started to take off. I was, I had founded, helped co-found a company called Tippet, which was a business media company. And so as part of that, my CEO and fo uh, founder, Scott Albro, pulled me downstairs one day and he's, listen, we have to eat our own dog food, go start a blog. And I'm like, okay. what? Are so I went to the SEO and the content team. Like, yeah, it's easy. Just go on WordPress and start blogging. And I named it the Funnel Holic, which was a good blog, which by the way, I, I let lapse. If anybody tries to look it up, it's a bummer. But so I started writing and it was doing okay. And then this thing called marketing automation really started to take off. And I started writing about that. And there at the time, those the Marketos and the Eloquas and the HubSpots were like just the content was their battlefield. And mm. so the and they needed thought leaders because remember this whole idea of thought leaders, they were always there, but the way content gave them a platform to be even bigger than they ever before, it democratized the ability to take a run at being a thought leader really started to happen back then. And they were looking for thought leaders and I didn't know that I was going to be one. I was just writing about it. And then I knew the guys that- a natural uh, born thought leader. Come on, <laughs> Craig. <laughs> I knew the guys at Marketo and Eloqua, but they they- said, oh, you should come to the webinar with us. And then I started doing webinars and I spoke at the first Marketo concert, uh, concert, uh, con customer conference, the Elba. It was that good. It was, like it was that good. I think the slip was a Freudian <laughs> reference that they, it well, was hey. like, like they, because the, they were playing, following the Salesforce playbook to some degree. Yeah. And the Salesforce events are a bit of a rock concert of a B2B world. It was a mix Absolutely. of Disney characters. And so yeah. I think that was a playbook that helped build the category of marketing automation. Yeah, look, they back then the world was just starting to get flooded with content and they helped flood it. So there was written, visual, and their conference. All those things they competed heavily with each other on. And I think the lesson though on if you take Dreamforce, for example, and I don't know this for sure, but everyone always talks about how the first thing Benioff did was hire his like best friend growing up and said, we're going to have the biggest customer conference of all time and you're going to make it happen this year. And he just from the get go, that was like this thing that he wanted to make happen. It's become this, as you said, a massive rock concert. I think the lesson though, if you take what you said, the Marketo and Eloqua, teams and then HubSpot, they made that customer conference as big as possible following that Dreamforce playbook. But I think the thing back then that we could take to now is like 
That was go big or go home content. That was not let's test. That was not let's do a little bit here or there and see how it works. That was like, no, we're going for broke and we're going to have the best conference we can have. We that we're going for broke. We're going to have the most and best content out there. They it was the, not let's use AI chat to regurgitate somebody somebody else wrote on LinkedIn. Yeah, that had viral yeah, limits. <laughs> for sure. But even yeah, even if you take non AI where everyone's writing three reasons you do this and it's everyone's doing the same content just to put content up and just quote unquote test the waters. Yeah, no, they were like, this is going to, we're going to be known for this and we're going to go do that. There is a lesson for today's world, right? Where there's so much content. And as you said, there's a, now there's a machine now that can build and deliver content for you that the, the key is you have to deliver you have to think big on your content and how you deliver it today otherwise literally you're just you're barely under table stakes and so yeah so even though it was back then that was a big learning which was like they viewed content as one of their key battlefields and they played that way whether it was the conference or back then Marketo had the definitive guides and so did Eloqua and they were trying to do better ones than each other. It, it was like, it was a different time in terms of some of the things that work, but the mentality is actually even more relevant today. That's yeah. interesting. Let, let's like, let's, we can come back to this topic, but since we we're in that, like that period, when you started that, like what I liked about the definitive guides is that actually they, there was substance to what they were putting together, right? Like the, you couldn't just put together a super lightweight blog or Twitter post and get the, to the kind of get the depth and trustworthiness of that guide. And I feel it was the, the world that we live in right now, the ability to have trustworthy content that's based on at least lived experience that's relevant the guides, whatever it is, the books, the long form podcasts that combined was maybe a form factor that's a little bit more modern for the busy minds and busy lives that we live in is a recipe because otherwise you just get lost in the noise of regurgitated types of things. So you need to go big both on the substance, but also now increasing on the form factor to compete against all the noise out there. What's your take on the difference in the landscape back then versus today. Yeah, I don't know if that's it. I would say that the substance has that you're pointing back to then that was the key. And then once again, right now, substance, your ability to deliver substance matters, right? Because it's too mm -hmm. easy to deliver platitudes and high level tips like and so i think that actually transfers and the need for it is heightened but i do have a twist on that which i'll deliver okay. in a second we'll talk about form factor second because because that is important not just because i'm on with you but because it matters but with topo so it's funny because we're actually moving against my career here as we look back but Topo, there was a lot of reasons Topo worked. One of them was Scott Albra, who was the founder of Tippet as well, right? He founded, he was the CEO of Topo that we founded together. And he had this thing, which was from the get-go, we had a motto, which was specificity wins. Because he, mm. and, and he said, that's how we're going to differentiate everything we do is we are going to be specific. And we had a methodology, which was call it main point, best practices, examples, how-tos, and exercises or training. We just wanted to give, we wanted act, to deliver actionable insights on everything we did. That was our format and our motto back then. And it made our, we were able to, if you take like Gartner and Topo and back to Forrester Serious Decisions, like we actually are high paid content produced okay it's mm -hmm. really content and people were um, paying you versus right now it's free or yeah. email capture most of the time yeah but gartner and forrester still exist but like that yeah but topo was like but my main point was because of that specificity that's how valuable it was that people were willing to pay and i think if you, the definitive guides represented specificity and i think now more than ever it's hard it's once again incredibly hard to get specific information 
it's easy to get tips. I can download, I could go to chat GPT and get tips and best practices right now, but how you go do that and the specificity around that is a differentiator. And as people think about their content, they should do that. However, if you ask John Miller, he's my definitive guides weren't working as well. In his most recent round, he said the times have changed. I think they've changed. I don't think that means definitive guides don't work. I think one of the keys here is that you can't just definitive guide everything. Like you have to find the niche that your target market doesn't have enough info about and will excite them and inspire them as well. Now, in this era, there should be lots of opportunity for that because times have changed, right? And new playbooks have emerged and new ways and approaches have emerged. But right now, if you do a definitive guide to content, that will flop. You'll get some, but it will not deliver the way a HubSpot one would have delivered 12 years ago. But if you deliver on, I don't know, like the, I'm just making this one up, but like right now, clearly as a channel to get people to your content, LinkedIn, there's been a lot written about it, but I think now we're at the peak LinkedIn, right? Where you're, if you're not playing there and delivering your content there, then you're going to fall behind. That's a game change. And most of the stuff out there on LinkedIn is fine. There is some specificity, but it's like for salespeople, it's for individuals. And, and, but right now, what do you do as a company, as a founder? And how do you go play that? And mm. how many times do you post like these that I'm just making up an example of like, where it's not just about it's the content and the niche and the, the value of that specificity matters. Otherwise it's just going to be, it'll once again, even if you write a hundred page definitive guide, that thing won't compete because you, the differentiation of what you're talking about matters. And so, yes, the specificity and substance, there, it's more key now than it's ever been, but that doesn't mean you could just take on the most typical of topics. Like you have to find the th most vexing issues and challenges or new right. ideas in your target market and deliver those. So that's, I watched some of these founders just killing it on LinkedIn for, that I just brought, that's why I just brought that up. That's new. I'm sorry, everyone's, that's not new because we've been on LinkedIn forever. Mm, like the numbers are incredible right now. And there's founders with zero marketing budget, leading people, delivering content in LinkedIn on a daily basis. That's allowing them to build followings. That's bringing people to their websites and their content experiences there. Okay. And then form factor, you don't know. In my opinion, you don't know. You don't know which form fact you don't actually want to bet that one form factor works one you always want to deliver delightful experiences because there's too much happening out there for people for them not to want to spend time at a place that's visually stimulating or visually appealing okay so that's yes but also you should take any piece of your content and you should have multiple form factors for that because you don't know everyone asks me it's look there's the obvious we're all consumers of content we're going to gravitate yeah. towards great experiences and ease of use and those things that's table stakes but a webinar versus a white paper versus a video versus you want to provide everyone both and some will gravitate to one versus the other for me i like I do read, but I do like visual experiences, things that are more fun to watch. So that's just, and that's me. And I think a lot of people are like that. I think it's working really well. But the main point is you should have a varied portfolio of how you present this substantive content. So it's really interesting. So I think what you've, you, the twist that if I had to sum, summarize is, the twist is you need to give people the confidence that there is substance underneath. It, but it needs to be a more focused because it's a noisy, noisy environment and be ideally focused in the areas where people care the most about to learn more information, where there's the most change or there's the biggest opportunities, biggest levers. And then yeah. the form factor is you're saying two things. One is, yes, by default, the more engaging, the better. Right. Mm -hmm. And the second theme is. And you don't really know what engages whom, right? Because we know that human beings are generally, there's different learning styles that's as old as learning technology. And so we want to engage them in different styles. There is different levels of busyness, levels of interest for the same human being. So they might actually 
enjoy some media in different formats, even depending on when you catch them, when you, you know, catch stage them. in the project. So you have to have a multiplier effect on visual engagement or experiential engagement of some kind, and then additional multiplier effect on repurposing that across channels, all again, to be trusted, relevant, and specific enough to break through the noise. Uh, so I think that's a great outline for kind of what the world of content is today. All right. As to summarize, we've captured the kind of the level of specificity, relevance, but you still need to have the evidence so people trust that this is contextually relevant feedback. And then there's multiple form factors uh, that we need to, to do to part to support different usage, usage behaviors right now. And then on top of it, all of those form factors need to, you need to maximize the audience engagement level. So one of the things that is really intriguing to us as we look at the, the reports and presentations that you were publishing back in Topo era, like oftentimes the deliverable was still the PowerPoint and sometimes mm -hmm. the research or PDFs. And when you look at it today, I think there's not dramatic change, right? Some of those, maybe if somebody like Gartner would have an online, more kind of web-based version, and then the downloadable version of the report. Um, most of the slide decks are still en ending up before they go out being saved as PDF files and so on. So what's, I'm curious, what's your take on why some of these form factors stick around, right? And we have a hypothesis that we even covered already. They have maybe a sense of substantiveness that's implied in the nature of the report, a sense of permanence as opposed to a lightweight blog or web page. But you know what? You've published these things, right? You're training a bunch of folks now and you're helping them build their trusted content. What have you seen stay the same in the form factors and what has changed for trusted content? For trusted content. Well, first of all, just the at Topo, we created one form factor because the truth is we are never that big. It's the rigmarole that's required to get multiple factors perfected back then was too hard. So we mm -hmm. just said, what's the one? We do believe people ascribe value to density. That was back then. This is one of those contradictions in the market now is the... We found that shorter, more, I don't know, big font, shorter blog post-esque materials did not do as well as denser information-filled content. We didn't believe that was going to be true. It just was. It just did better. That was back then. I do believe we were delivering research, which is a different deliverable than what some other people do. I don't... So I like... PDFs. I get excited. I trust them, but I'd rather watch or look at something more visually pleasing now. Maybe that's Jade. I, when I tell, I work with startups when they're thinking about their content right now, it's most important to figure out what we talked about before is what is substantive. And then let's worry about the form factors. But, but when you do, I do think you can deliver visually appealing digital content now that has the same feel for substantive, substantive value as that of what used to be our P, uh, PowerPoints to PDFs. The, there is this one thing you brought up, which was like, we used to do the PDF versions and they were like 50 pages to, I lost years of my life creating those things. <laughs> but we did, even now, you'll, you you still see everyone wants PowerPoint decks. If you go to a webinar, what's the, what do you spend the first 10 minutes in the chat dealing with? Everyone asking for the PowerPoint deck. Yeah. So that's tried and true. It's okay. Everyone's like, it doesn't prove anything. It's just another form factor. But there's so many people now that are looking on their phone or looking with five minutes in their day to try to pick up some insights like that. I don't know. That's what I do is I don't have much time. So I'm in between things and I saw something that I wanted to look at. I'm not going to spend the time on a long PDF. I am going to do, I don't know what you said, I think is true, which is it depends when and who and in, in those things. But anyway, I do, I, we did find, and we still, you could still see that today, that longer form, Blog posts sometimes still perform really well if they're substantive. If they're 
deep. I think people do look at, you know, some of these uh, materials, depending on what you're trying to de deliver and to who, and they equate value to density and length. Uh, yeah, they almost, say they don't. They say they don't, but they, they say do. they don't. Yeah. It's almost, I think the word that you used is paradox, which is, I think it was pretty like relevant words because we want, we will want to download the PDF as an example, or we'll want to know that it's downloadable, but we may not necessarily consume it, but we may want to know for psychological safety reasons that like, Hey, this is part of my little stash of knowledge that's going to buy a handpicked and we want to do this. And I think that creates, yeah. if you over rely on the, that old kind of the psychology works, but if you over rely on that, why? Because it's cr trusted, credible. It's long. Somebody took the time to lay out in logical structured way, hopefully that content. And then the, so the challenge is it's trusted, but I, then to the point, like maybe, and maybe people will download it, but will they be able to go and easily say, Hey, here, down, check out this PDF, go to page 44 and then to page 59 and then do this and this because of that, right? That's a high, that's unlikely, right? Like even was highly motivated, late in market buyers, that's a stretch. So there is something I think about the, from the innovation perspective, there's something that's really interesting that we've seen is that you need to give people easily digestible and actionable mm -hmm. things together with the substance and confidence that this is comprehensive piece. Or if it's not a PDF, like one thing, it's a hub of content, right? And so yeah. in that hub of related things, right? This is one nugget that's shareable, but it, it has context. And in the world where we don't know who to trust or if AI is creating these emails or whatever blogs, the context raises a lot of the credibility. Right. So I should trust a topo report on topic A, because I know that's just one topic that you covered in depth, but you actually went through the whole value chain of sales tech or whatever go to market yeah. research. So that context gave the confidence to say, okay, when I'm drilling into this, is the one that I go. And then there's a lot of convenience and going, okay, I could just, you know, deep link to page 54. And that page has a video inside it. So if I'm a video consumer, I could also consume it in a video. And so that way you're hitting kind of the psychology and instant gratification of the Insta era together with the book, right? The credible authoritative yeah. format that has been honed for millennia at this point for for way to convey trusted re information. Yeah, look, I there is so late stage content is interesting because like the form factor there that everyone makes fun of yet they still ask for and salespeople still deliver is the data sheet. Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. they don't read it. Here's the thing is they want the quick act. I learned more from explainers, video content about product than I do about reading about product because I get bored senseless. But I would never enter a buying cycle if you didn't give me that data sheet in, in dense content. You see what I mean? That is where the par the late stage is where the paradox actually lives in a way that's so unique, right? Which is, it's very similar to what you were just saying, which is you need the backup. Like you need to deliver that. It's almost like comfort. It's there. It will yeah. be there as re for reference and whatnot. But for me, as a as a learner, that's not the content. Like a definitive guide on doing something business wise, top of funnel, even middle of funnel, whatever. I'll read that. But like for my product decisions and what I buy, that's going to be different. I'm going to need you to create a sort of dense, really product specific content, even something real highly technical. I'm not going to read it. I'm just, that's the truth. I'm not. And I don't believe And salespeople that would rely on someone to read a data sheet and then get mad at marketing because it didn't work. Like that doesn't, that's never been good. You, you, that thing is just there for comfort and for reference. So you give them these things or you give them a hub, you give them the 
that's there's actually comfort in the, the ability to reference and the fact that in these the new hub model it's always there so i can go back to it yeah that you have to have now okay but speaking uh, of a hub speaking of a hub yeah. i can a screen share for our audience that's here one of your masterpieces from scale venture partners which is a, from one of your webinars where you've actually spoke about the kind of the demo approach and you know how that's required right now to have a different flavor of engaging other than the product right like i say as a data sheet as a kind of default entry point like table stakes requirement what you're describing here is we have typically it's not a single demo right there's different solutions and so how do you self select to the areas that are most relevant to the customer the challenges and so one of the things that we've seen and developed kind of a solution for is interactive product tours that allow a sales rep who doesn't need to know every knack and crooney of a total demo suite, especially in multi-product companies, to still find something that's relevant to the customer that came up in a conversation and kind of instantly get to there that in a way that addresses their challenges and it's also a micro content and much more visual. What have you seen... In terms of adoption, and I think one one of the interesting things, you have product-led growth companies in your portfolio, you have enterprise companies that want to add product-led velocity, which is where this type of thing typically comes in. Any observations about what most innovative companies are doing here and what's working in the market beyond the product bore you to tears data sheet or kind of a product marketer like myself in my past life putting out some product yeah. launch material that would bore most people. Yeah, but the demo is an, a more visual example of the product data sheet, the way that it was delivered years ago. Right. So it's the same. The metaphors are the same here. I, it's You have to have a demo, but they're torturous, like just speech or feature spits often. And product tours, I think, and interactive demos and interactive sort of anonymous test environment. All these new things that are coming out are just catching hold. They will, they're going to work because, and they work for some today. It's just, and so it's starting to catch. And that's partly because A, you, you can't just show, it's the same thing as the product. You can't just show someone a generic horizontal view of the product. You can't read a horizontal view of the product that's got to, you want to know the areas where it's relevant to me and to what I'm trying to do. And I just, in my personal opinion, I think that's where automation is going to make a big difference in the buyer's life. So if you take the example I just gave, I use the product data sheet as an example, yeah. but I use explain my, my, my juxtaposition against that is I use explainers and product tours to learn everything I don't use the dry the stuff. Did, I need the, the dry. dry I need the dry stuff. And there's a couple examples. I'm a big fan of interactive demo product tours. I think it's the time is coming and it's going to keep catching just because of the reality of the buyer, how you engage the asynchronous buying. There's a whole bunch of reasons for it, but even in the hand as you said, just giving even enabling the salesperson to be able to yeah deliver product in a relevant way. That makes total sense. I think like it, so, so you can see like the, what it is, is the same as it was 20 years ago, how we deliver it, it needs to get better and technology will actually help us go do that. So, Another one is, yeah, go ahead. So yeah. let's dive into that because I do think there's a fundamental difference in the technology. So the, for example, you always could have found like a, a list of all the data sheets, right? Companies always had, like, hey, here's our resources section. You could look up all the data sheets and you could find the data sheet that's relevant to you or you think is relevant to you. And then if it's one, one to two pager, that's not too big of a deal. But if it's a longer asset, then there's a portion within that's relevant to you. And that typically was a pain to do. With the demos and the proactive product demos in particular, we're finding something similar where I think this is the way the world-class demo that what you've set up there is actually done in person is you identify, hey, typically customers have X, Y, or Z problem. Pick the one that you care about. And then people select that. And then they are taken to that demo environment and they could continue further and further self-select themselves. 
And that's yeah. just so much more relevant, right? Like it's pretty hard to nail that was a product even like the, the tour people tried to do it like it works for simpler products but i think it's just giving that autonomy to the buyer to find the relevance or if it's a seller to enable the seller to be effective is what's right. actually not been that easy to do and i agree custom three three day prep before the demo was scs building out these hypotheses of what might be relevant was incredibly an efficient approach to do the same visual engagement and personalization. Yeah, just to be clear, I agree. I, what I was saying is demos have been here for 20 years. That hasn't changed. Even recordings of demos were around years ago. The automation will allow us to pe for people to choose their own adventure but towards like use case relevance. And, and that's going to not just help the buyer to help the sales rep because the sales reps predisposition, the good ones, the top 20% would lead people down the right use case. The other 80 will just try to throw everything out there on the table. It's a terrible experience for the buyer. The automation helps both sides make sure that we're, sales is delivering the right in, uh, view and information. And then the buyer is, is getting what they need at a, in an, an economical or efficient way, their view of the product or the solution or the use case that they need. Yeah. If I, I just, I agree. Great. I agree with you. Yeah, totally. Well, and then, so one, so what's happening is we're discussing this is we're going through the range of formats, right? We're saying, Hey, look, you can't get rid of the data sheet because it's maybe table stakes or people just expect it to be there as comfort. comfort. And who knows, maybe somebody is very linear and they do want the kind of the, you never, know. Yep. the, you never know, right? There's just different styles. We've been like, we've been amazed at looking at the, what we call digital body language of our consumers. And some people just really like to go slide by slide. Right. And it yep. kind of depends a little bit on their familiarity with the content and maybe like personality traits. And so that just one of true. And then there are people, I put myself in that category, that have a attention span of a goldfish on the yeah. on, on, on the for third cup of coffee. And they they want to jump to the things that they really like need to see at this particular moment. And then if they feel like, oh my God, this is awesome, they'll go back and maybe go do the linear thing. But as they need to validate the depth. And yeah. so so we're seeing this range. And so yep. we brought up this idea of a content hub. Like, what's your take having delivered training and educational content and dealt with all the styles? Are we basically going to need to deliver the same content in multiple learning types to A, give people confidence and also just to support the fact that people just want to know that it's there in the format that they prefer? And then if that's the case, like, how do we avoid overloading people? Because that's another tricky part of this. Yeah, I can have all the content that's relevant to you that's been published on topic A or in format B or some combination thereof. But that could be a lot. Yeah, for sure. And there's a trade-off there between, hey, it's simple. Here's single resource. Maybe it's one resource and it just only works one way or here's a variety. Have you, have, have you followed yeah. your companies or your past experience of kind of how to adapt for that? Is this a trick question? Because the tech, I, it's the tech, technically, the it's the reason you want your hubs to be technical and not rely on a salesperson who's like zipping up all those files for people. Like we can learn, right? In their experiences and start to modify the hub to their liking based on the fact that it is it is a digital sales room. I, I don't know, I, I'm gonna throw that back to you because that has been my theory, which is if we don't know, we can learn. You don't create an overwhelming scenario, but you do give people the access. And can we learn enough about the buyer and their the way that they engage with content enough to start to use the technology can help us be more, I don't know, on point with the form factors and the type of content they need. I don't know, I'm gonna throw that back to you because I've felt I've, when I've looked at digital sales rooms or anything like that, I felt like that was one of the most interesting things that we, you know, that came with that product. Look, I think we're, what I'm trying to balance is being thorough 
and be and then like finding the buyer at the level of where they are and i don't think right. that's that obvious because we are in that world and yeah. there's a there's an appetite right like for me as a product marketer for example wearing that hat i want a repository of all the kind of relevant content for my portfolio right that's great and then as a sales yeah. rep who is typically fed by was content from that product marketer they have an anxiety in our experience where they would say look if i get somebody right in the digital sales room like that's over dense on day one it's going to be an information overload and they may yeah. get distracted so what we've yeah. seen is some sort of a trade-off where people you start the room and you have like maybe one or two pieces of content in there to begin with and yeah. then you build over time but it, I don't think that like the nobody, I don't think anybody has figured this out, right? Like we've, we are in the experience business. Yeah. So we're already like thinking about this much more and have more data about the actual engagement in the content. And I think yeah. we're learning. I don't, so that's why I'm actually really curious what you yeah. see was the, the challenge of information overload while the tr building that trust and how do you, is it just prioritizing and featuring the more, pr pr more likely wins or is it like AI personalization that's going to be the answer that's done on the fly? Those are open questions, I think, for me. Yeah, I don't know. I think you guys will continue to have real data on this and can, that's why I was throwing it back to you. I'm, mine is just personal experience and I typically recommend what you brought up, I don't know, 45 seconds ago as you were talking, which is I tell them to start small and relevant and as tightly as possible we can add to it based on what we learn as we go i know it's hard part of the impulse we're trying to fight is i, I always joke about this but i remember i years ago one of the sales reps we had really old school guy like he would dump the whole price list in the body of the email and send them everything and hope something hits and that actually meant that nothing would hit yeah so I feel like we have to fight that impulse. It's there and people can have access to this, but you should start with uh, what we know is most going to resonate with them. And that could be what we've learned on without having met them and what their typical challenges and what that particular persona or market cares about all the way through the sales processes. We learn more about them or we find out what type that they're gravitating to side of the, the hub right and, and can we learn can we just gather enough information so that we could be as relevant as tight as possible in the experience that they get and then we add to it that so i think that's what you said uh, that's what i would say normally to people uh, to get to deliver the most value to the buyer and I know it's hard Some for a lot of people their sort of instinct is, oh, what if I miss something? And it's look, the quality of the content on whatever that it is that you deliver, you should rate it on its relevance and substantive value. And as long as it adds value, even if it's not exactly what the buyer wants, we can figure out what the buyer wants. We just want to maintain that credibility. So if you put three pieces together, I'm making up the number uh, for the buyer, it's tight, right? Ultimately, I think they'll consume more. I don't know. I'm going to learn more from guys like you as you watch real content consumption. But as long as, long as that content reflects the value, right, then you're going to be okay delivering less and then providing more based on feedback from them. And, and as we learn more about what they need, we can add on to it. But for me, tighter is better. Got it. I think that kind of broadly leads into this one somewhat controversial question that I have that's in my head. There is a category called sales engagement of products, right? Mm -hmm. Great products. I think the key word is sales, right? Like to me in, yeah. that, in that word, they are meant, it's not like sales engagement sounds like you create something engaging for when you sell, but it's actually a way for sale sellers to be more efficient, actually, versus mm -hmm. really engaging, in my view. But there's probably some combination of there. But it's really yeah, like yeah. a sales efficiency. It should have been called like a bunch of sales efficiency tools, different types. 
and maybe some insight over time, right? Because if they're good sales efficiency tools, they'll start to capture the actual outcomes of moving to the next level. That's very different in my head than buyer engagement, which is what we've been talking a little bit earlier was these demos that are more experiential and there's benefits, right? Like you probably need to have some appreciation for sales productivity <laughs> to try to engage before you get to engage the buyers. But if you're very productive spamming people, it will not work in today's day and age as an example, or there's, yeah. there's this short-term tactics that could lead to long-term not doing the types of things that you want to be doing, especially if you're playing the in the long-term game and or in limited market. And so I'm curious, what's your take, right? Like you've seen these trends, you've pioneered some of these categories yourself and defined them. Is there something that you people just get locked in the category and just it's hard to get out and pull back up and say, is, is this category relevant in this day and age? Is now that we figure out how to send mass email, mass pseudo personalized emails, yep. is, should we slow down on the sales engagement and move into something else? And what's the kind of the life lifetime relevance of these categories, right? Is it just a portfolio that everybody needs to have and then you start emphasizing, de-emphasizing things over time? Or do you think, hey, like sales engagement needs to be there, will be always be there, it's foundational. And then on top of it, there's going to be next level plays that give you a differentiation or next level categories that give you differentiation. Yeah. So category is a complicated beast. I I've, I learned a couple things watching it. So over the time, and yeah, I help this. There's a, a fun insider story on the name sales engagement platform that I was part of. I, I forget the year that was, maybe 2011 or something. But look, I, I think one thing is the buyers choose and gravitate to the naming convention. Mm. I think that's really, really important. So I, years ago, I had, I, there was this thing that always stuck in my craw, which was, I don't know if you remember this or around for this, but like marketing automation, Eloqua and Marketo, and I think the analyst firms, this was pre me being an analyst, tried to make the move from renaming marketing automation to revenue performance management. Mm. And if you think about the name, that's a good name. By yeah. the way, that's what Clary should. Clary you know, is right now. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so, yeah. Revenue. They're not using. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're using something a little different. And I brought Steve Woods and Joe Chernoff and John Miller together when I was at Gartner to talk about that. What happened? How did that not work? And they were talking about how uh, the buyers didn't want to talk about it. And even John Miller's like, marketing automation is not the perfect name. It's actually not a great name if you think about what we actually did. He said, but the buyers took it and they hold it. And that in and of itself is valuable. And so that that was a really good learning. And that's why some, as people, since Play Bigger Book came out, people are trying to name categories and do these things. And some stick, some don't, even if some are better than others. Some just do. And so... That that's that's one thing. But I but to your point, which is I think you have two choices. One is you can redefine what that category should be. Mm -hmm. That is, I think both are hard. The reason that is good, for example, Siebel had CRM before Salesforce. They redefined it. Yeah, they redefined it. And, and what that category should have and should be. So you can do that. If it's a significant change in everything, then a new name in that category could subsume or knock out the previous category. Although I, we, I live in the world of insider, I'm in Silicon Valley. So we're always going to gravitate to the cooler thing. But if you look being at Gartner, there's categories that people have declared boring or dead that have been around and are still mm -hmm. billion dollar categories in and around still today. Were there new categories around that same topic that developed and became hot? Yes. It depends. If the buyers are gravitating towards an area and, and it's a tough decision. I couldn't go through how we would figure out the best way to do it today, but redefining it with the new rules, you would take what's happening today, which is what you're bringing up, like buying experiences, 
their expectations have changed. You can't batter them with emails anymore. That would be the kind of context that would say we either kill sales engagement or we reinvent it. Right. In my mm-hmm. opinion, because of the proliferation of that wording convention, sales engagement platform, even though I know it's not perfect anymore, it's still worth taking the name and the momentum of the category and redefining it versus try to start. Well, love for so this is actually very relevant. So there's an emerging category, and we mentioned it, digital sales room. And that sort of was Godars and G2 folks put it out there. It's still not like a defined category. And I have a personal beef with it because it's almost gets us back into the word sales. Whereas really for that to work, it's about the buyer. It should be about digital buyer room or digital client room or something that creates a great experience for that for the audience. And it's a philosophical difference, right? But but you, the buyers, obviously, sales organization, something that was marketing, enabling it. Uh, and it's a tricky one, right? Because you probably are like, if I'm in sales, I want to, I can't afford, I probably want to buy something that has sales <laughs> in the thing to justify the investment. So it's almost yeah. the psychology of the buyer is not necessarily connected to the outcomes, kind of what you're saying of what that category needs to deliver, it could be connected to their role. Yeah. Look, I it's not clear to me that the terminology digital sales room has taken off. I do think there's still up for grabs whether there's a another category name there. But there's but let's pretend it's taken off. Cuz Gartner's big on it. They've done really good work on it. You mentioned Goddard, there's other folks I see it being pitched in the Valley and seed in series a land. I, so there is some movement there, but that let's, if we said, okay, digital sales room is the name. I don't believe it is, but you might, if you do, and yeah. despite its flaws and despite being inward facing a, it would be worth attacking the name as a way for a marketing perspective for you guys to differentiate yourself right. in the market. But the idea there would likely be to pull the digital sales room traffic members of that category behind you. Yeah, Yeah. you'd want that still. You would not want, you would still want people who are actually looking at digital sales rooms to consider you. But like from a campaign marketing and positioning perspective, I think juxtaposing against how inward looking that naming convention is would be really powerful. Uh, I do think. Ultimately, the idea would be to, it becomes less about the the parsing the words in the category and more about what it takes to win in that category. And I, I would say in that one, you're it's nuts to not be taking a buyer first point of view there. Because yes, sales gets the benefit of that or the organization yeah. does from a content perspective, but that's built fundamentally for the buyer. Emails to them are not, they're supposed to be, but like this is like the ultimate, this is like their digital place that we are providing. That's theirs. If you, it has to have a customer experience first approach. Uh, otherwise, hey, but it's, the, the, it's the, not going to work. This theory is right. But the vendors selling it are the same vendors that have sold other sales productivity tools, right? Or asset management tools. And so yeah. I think it's an interesting one. I think you brought up Salesforce earlier, right? So I was actually there at the time, like circa 2004, five. And I remember the positioning was on-demand CRM back in the days, right? Because it was easy to understand, right? Yes, we had the no software and the whole thing. That was more just to interrupt people. But the category was CRM. And then the word on-demand implied something that's readily available and convenient for the user. And it was at the time precursor to cloud or SaaS, right? Like that was the name of that same thing at the time. And it was, it worked. I think it worked. And then we really could literally clearly position, here's the old way of doing CRM, whether it's an enterprise at Siebel or SMB versions that act and so on, right? And here's the new way of doing it. And it it really, I think, resonated with the market to to build off of existing momentum versus call it something else, which nobody knew what it was. Yeah, if you do that, you're finding, remember the, if you take Kevin Maney, the author of Play Bigger has this thing where he says, look, the the category 
is shelf space in the supermarket. What you want is there to be a ketchup section. Then you want it so people decide without your branding yet that I'm going to go get ketchup. So I'm going to go to the ketchup aisle. Mm. And then when they go in there, how do you position yourself? And by the way, to, yes, just yesterday, I went to the relish area because my kid wanted relish. I mean, this is interesting. Like in the relish aisle, there's spicy relish. A lot of, by the way, spicy relish. I thought it was really interesting. I know it sounds like corny to bring this up, but the spot in the aisle or the aisle in the supermarket metaphor that Kevin always talks about is really important. If there's already space on the aisle and you can compete and out position what relish really is in that aisle, that's the winning form because you want people to come to go get the relish. Now, if it's not relish, then you that's your goal of category design is to create this new section in the aisle. Because you want pe you want the market to gravitate towards the category in the supermarket, and then you want to win in the category. And so, in the case of, I don't think digital sales rooms is there yet, but you would know more. But like in my experience as an analyst, I didn't feel like I still think it had it had had a lot of explaining that needed to be done there. But CRM's a good one, right? There was yeah. already a CRM aisle. It was just there's a new one called on demand that started to dominate that shelf space and that everyone else had to follow and the predominant design for that came out of salesforce yeah it's an interesting it's an interesting part of your decision making is do i do i take on a new category and, and try to build one or do i try to redefine the one that already exists and what's worth it and what's not worth it yeah but well i love you by the way go ahead. yeah go ahead oh, please i'll just say slightly renaming a category yeah, slightly renaming a category, I'm not sure works. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to find evidence. Maybe someone could throw me evidence on that. You either go on radical and recreating a new one or reshaping the definition of a current one. Anyway, sorry, that was my recap of what I was saying, as you were. I didn't mean That's great. Look, I think this has been such a treat to get your take on all things go to market and how they're evolving and even like in the areas that are personally relevant to me. But I, I want to, I think it was a great showcase of what you're bringing to the portfolio companies at scale. Maybe as we wrap up and folks want to follow you and engage with you, can you talk about the category of what you're building was the platform at scale in the world where you fit and what kind of folks should be coming your way to learn more and have these types of wonderful conversations that we've been having where I've learned a lot. Oh, thank you. Look, like scale is claim to fame is we're going to take founder led go to market and help them turn that founder led success into go to market machines. And so we've built our knowledge base, our resources and our internal products in order to help people go do that. And so, you know, look, and, and a lot of our stuff is out there. We publish a ton on LinkedIn. We have blogs. People can, if they can get in, they can reach out to me and then potentially come to some of our events, but we're trying to be on cutting edge because now is not the time to play around and whip out playbooks from 20 years ago. You've got 18 to 22 months to turn yourself into a go-to-market machine. And so we're always looking for new things and seeing if they're validated in the marketing and then figuring out how we can publish, share, and help people go execute against us. So we have a lot of great ideas at the Scale VP dot com website and then also on our linkedin we share a lot and give a lot away also i have a podcast myself called the transaction not affiliated with scale that's mine um, where i talk about a lot of these things as well i hope our audience reaches out and connects i've learned a ton from this discussion and from years of following your content through all those channels from starting from topo day so Craig, thank you so much for longtime fan, first time caller here was you, but excited to introduce you to our audience. Awesome. Well, it, was a, it was great to be on. It was great hanging out and hopefully we can do it again. And when you learn more about what works and what doesn't work in the digital experience realm, I want to hear about it. Awesome.